earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him which cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, Jehovah of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is forgiven thee. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall, I, uh, whom shall I send, and whom shall go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. As Isaiah would behold the majesty of God upon his throne, high and exalted. As Isaiah would behold the seraphim, the mighty beings, in homage and in reverence to God, flying with two wings and giving reverence by covering face and feet in the presence of the Almighty God, Isaiah would say, I have seen the king. I must be dead. If not, I will surely die. Then he gets even further confirmation of this vision and he is uh, assured of, the, uh, of the, the mercies of God given, this iniquity taken away. Then he is now thoroughly prepared to go and take this message to the lost. We sing this song, and this song ought to motivate us to be better and to be stronger and to be more zealous for our God, to be more uh, diligent in making application of God's will in our lives that we may influence others to do the same. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. We appreciate you very much. For our visitors, you're our honored guests. If there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. If you have any questions, why do we do what we do the way that we do? Please ask. We'd be happy to address that. If you have a question about the lesson specifically, I'll be back there when the service is over. Uh, if we can't give you a good Bible reason for what we say, we ought not to be saying it. So please open your Bibles and follow along with us as we go through this lesson. If you want an outline, we've got some in the foyer, but your Bible is far greater than my outline. Paul would say in Romans 15 and verse 4, the things written aforetime are written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Verse 5 says, God is the God of consolation. When we think of consolation, we think of comfort, don't we? God is the God of comfort. Through reading the Old Testament, we can see that God has never failed, that God is always faithful, that God is able to provide, that God is able to answer prayers, that God is able to provide for the promises that He's made. Yes, He is a God of comfort, and we read of Him through His inspired Word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Given for us. Given to us that we may learn and study, as Brother Lee mentioned, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, study or give diligence to present thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, handling aright the word of truth. Let's do it this morning. The highway, Isaiah chapter 35 and verse number 8. I want us to look at this this morning. If you will, turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 35 and let's hear what saith the Lord. Verse number 1, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and shall rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto, uh, unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with the recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For on the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass and reeds and rushes. And an highway shall be there, and a way it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go thereupon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. Then shall uh, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee 
away. It's so often that in the prophets we read of something new and different. We read of an environment in which there is no crying, there is no tears. There is something new and different compared to the captivity that they would face, to the sufferings that they would have, that Judah would have at the hands of Babylon, or that, uh, that, that Israel would suffer at the hands of mighty Assyria. And we read of this time in which there would be a restoration And we understand the ultimate fulfillment of that. Not the uh, immediate, but the remote con context of those would be applying to the offering of salvation through Christ in His gospel. Romans 1, 16 and 17. The term highway is often used in a metaphorical way to emphasize a specific way that we can walk to please God. Notice Isaiah 11 and verse 16. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Isaiah 19 and verse number 23. In that day there shall be an highway out of Egypt to Assyria and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria. And the Egyptians shall serve the Assyrians. Isaiah 40 and verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his straight in the desert a highway for our God. I wonder who that refers to. Well, the New Testament tells us who that refers to. That this would be a uh, speaking of the one making preparation for, for the Lord would be John. And John, by the way, would prepare ye the way for Jehovah. But John prepared the way for Jesus, the, pre, the, the incarnate Christ. Yes, Jesus is God. John 8 verse 58. Jehovah means self-existing. And that would apply to all three persons of the Godhead. Isaiah 40 verse 3. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness prepare you the way. So when we're talking about highway or way, we're talking about a, a metaphor for a specific and narrow path on which to trod in order to please God. As directed by his inspired precepts, and obligations. Now let's look specifically at the one in chapter 35. Verse number 8. And an highway shall be there and a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. Now I know this isn't the biggest writing. And I apologize. I tried to make it a little bit bigger and I keep forgetting to do that, Eddie. But the way is singular. And then highway shall be there in the way, and it shall be called the, definite article, the way of holiness. Let's look at this in the Hebrew. A thoroughfare as turnpike, a highway. It occurs one time in the King James. Let's look at a word it's related to. A root word, as Strong's would say. Proverbs 16 and verse 17. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keepeth his way preserves his soul. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil as per God's divine instructions. From texts such as these, we see that God obligates a specific way for the saints to walk in. Isn't this a consistent theme in Scripture? True or false? You ready? You can nod if you want to for true or do this for false. True or false? God has always allowed man to do what he wants to. Nope. God has never obligated anything for man in order to be saved or to receive a blessing. Nope. God doesn't care what you do as long as you have a good heart. Nope. God wants you to be a moral person, but he doesn't really care what you do outside of that. Nope. The way of man is right in his own eyes. Nope. Right? You seeing a common theme here? God obligates us to act a certain way. Period. In Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17 it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes from God says, not from what God doesn't say. Faith isn't based on my heart, my opinions, my dreams, my whims, my desires. Faith is not based on what mama taught me. Faith is not based on old grandpa and his uh, religious dogma. Faith is not based on the precepts of men or the synods of denominations or the, the manuals that prescribe doctrines and covenants. Faith is based foursquare upon God said. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6 by faith, excuse me, Hebrews 11 and verse number 7 by faith Noah being warned of God of things yet to be seen 
prepared an ark for the saving of his, of his house. Noah acted by faith. Genesis 6.22 says this, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah acted by faith when he heard what God said and simply obeyed him. Faith comes by hearing God's word. Faith isn't based on my opinions. Faith isn't based on my life experiences. Faith is not based on the subjectivity and the morality of uh, the status quo. Faith is based on God and His inspired Word. We have this over and over. Anybody remember Enoch? Genesis 5? Enoch walked with God. Enoch was the seventh from Adam, and Enoch never tasted death. There have been two men that have walked this earth that have never tasted death. Elijah and Enoch. Why? It's a good question. Maybe it gives you and I hope. But we understand that Enoch walked with God, Genesis 5, 24. We understand Genesis 6, and verse 9, Noah walked with God. What a beacon of light Noah was in a world that he lived in. Where the thought of man was nothing but evil continually. And God would see Noah as a beacon of light in this dark world. Where men were wicked and depraved and violent and oppressive. But Noah walked with God. James chapter 2 verses 18 through 23. Abraham was called the friend of God. I did a lesson on that very topic one time. The friend of God. Do you know who the friend of God is? Well, Abraham. Yeah, that's true. But do you know that you can also be a friend of God? If you do what Abraham did, then you'll be what he was. A friend of God. That doesn't mean that you live under the same obligations and commandments that Abraham lived, being a patriarch. We're under the dispensation of Christ. Colossians 2.14. Romans 2 emphasizes this, that the Jews suffered the same condemnation as those uh, that were not Jews. Romans 1. And the need is seen in chapter 3 of the book of Romans. Every man of both Jew and Gentile stands accountable before God in need of saving. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 23. So we understand that Abraham was called a friend of God because Abraham did what God said. In Romans 4 and verse number 12, it says that we also can walk in the steps of that faith of Abraham. We can do the same. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, can two walk together except they've agreed. That's a simple principle, isn't it? You think of someone walking hand in hand, you're in unison, you're walking together, you're in agreement, you're in concord, you're in fellowship. And then imagine folks going two opposite ways. How could you possibly hold to the hand of God if you're going a different way than He's going? Look at how the, way, uh, the word way is used. Same way. Highway, metaphor, the way, a specific path that we are expected to walk on the way the way of holiness the way of holiness is God's way notice in Genesis 18 and verse 19 God would say for I know him speaking of Abraham and that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken unto him the way of the Lord Abraham would be a uh, he would see God in Genesis 17 in verse number 1. And God would identify himself. And he would say, I am the Lord God Almighty. Walk thou before me and be thou. You ready for this? Perfect. Well, Brother Eric, I'm going to tell you something. No man's perfect on their own. Amen. But when we see the word perfect in a, in a version like the King James, we need to understand that often it's speaking of mature. We need to understand that perfect is speaking of something not quite uh, dependent on self and your own perfection. But it's the same word used in Leviticus chapter 1 when it speaks of an unblemished sacrifice. Unblemished. Unblameable. Abraham, I am the Lord God Almighty. Walk thou before me and be thou unblameable in all that I command you to do. Be faithful. He would say in Revelation 2 and verse 10. Those, those concepts are synonymous. Walk in the way that I instruct you and you will be what I want you to be, God says, in essence. 
God would test Israel after Joshua's death to see how they would obey in Judges chapter 2. That through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord. Notice that. To walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Judges 2.22 Ammon, the son of Manasseh, was disobedient, described in this way. And he forsook the Lord God of his fathers and walked not in the way of the Lord. 2 Kings 21, verse 22. Proverbs 10, verse 29. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction be to the workers of iniquity. Notice how Solomon describes the way of righteousness as strength. We talked about that this morning. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. God's way is not your way. No offense to you when I say that. I don't, I'm not saying that you're some creepy person and you're some weirdo. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you're just not good enough. No offense. I'm not either. We're not. If man was sufficient to attain heaven on his own, Jesus died in vain. Don't we understand that? It isn't about uh, being a decent, moral person. Life isn't about, uh, you know, just being a good guy. I asked somebody that one time. I said, what do you think is necessary in order to obtain the hope of the glories of heaven? And he said, well, I guess just be a good person. I said, well, there's a little bit more to it than that. And you know what he said? I sure hope not. That's so sad. Guess how many conversations we had afterwards of that? Zero. There's more to it than just being a good person. If, if, if just simply being a, a decent, upstanding citizen was the requirements of, of heaven, then Jesus wouldn't have had to die. But you see, it isn't good enough. Your way is not good enough. My way is not good enough. Listen to what Solomon would say in Proverbs 12, uh, 14, and verse number 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It seems what now? Oh, it seems right. Hey, man, I think this is the way to go. Look at our society today. Oh, I think this is great. I think this is wonderful. I think we should do this. I think it's a really good thing to rip babies out of the womb and throw them in a trash can. I think that's a really great thing. Well, God says it isn't. Proverbs chapter 16, that he hates hands that shed innocent blood. And if you don't know that's a baby, there's something wrong with you, by the way. But they, they think it's just perfectly right. There are other sins we can enumerate that society says is perfectly acceptable. I don't care what society says. I care what God says. And God says something is wrong. That settles it. Psalm 119 and verse number 89 still in your Bible. If you don't know it, you can look it up as I quote it to you. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So you know what man can do? Man could gather every beast of the field Every beast of the oceans. Man could gather all the host of heaven. Man could descend into the pits of Tartarus, 2 Peter chapter 2, and pull out those angelic beings that are there awaiting the punishment. Man could empty Hades and bring all of the wicked with him. And they could shake the fist in the face of God Almighty and say, No, we're going to change thy word and God's word will echo forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You won't change it. You can't change it. God Almighty reigns. Revelation as John would behold this magnificent symbolism and as he would record it for the seven churches of Asia, uh, Asia he would say the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Revelation chapter 19. And man can do nothing about it except humble himself and understand the truth. God's way is not your way. You remember that quote a minute ago from Isaiah 6? Imagine that. As Isaiah would behold the temple and the train of the Lord, his great, uh, the great tail of his robe would fill and the, and the glory of God and his essence and his Shekinah would fill this, this temple and, and the symbolism of the incense rising and the, being the, the presence of God and you seeing this magnificent image and not only seeing God on his throne, but you seeing the seraphim there in absolute homage and reverence to God. And that would suffice it to say that God is not like you. God would decree through the prophets of old in rebuke of the nation of Israel and say, Thou thoughtest I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. 
God is not like you. He's not your buddy. He's not your peer. He's not your pal. He is sovereign of all creation. He is holy and unblemished. And he will not even behold the wickedness of man. Nahum chapter 1. God's way is holiness. Listen to what Paul would write to those in Thessalonica. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, and so to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. What does sanctification mean? You are set apart for holy use. You are different. Oh, you Christians are so different. Thank you. That's actually a blessing if someone says that to you, right? Because you're doing what you're supposed to do. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, that's body, in sanctification and in honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us to uncleanness, but holiness. To do God's will is to, by definition, be holy. 1 Peter 1 and verse 16. The unclean man, as we're going back to the text in Isaiah 35. We've talked of the highway. We've talked of the way of holiness. The unclean man, this word. Foulness in a religious sense. Defiled. Polluted. Unclean. It is used as defiled in Numbers 9 and verse 6. And there were certain men who were defiled by the dead body of a man. Guess what you couldn't do under the law of Moses? Touch a dead body. Why? Well, there's this interesting thing that we came across, what, in the 18th century or 19th century? These guys got developed this kind of a, uh, 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 an experiment and they realized that, you know what? Uh, uh, germs are things we can't see. And these things you can't see can kill you. Did you know that? We know that now, don't we? That's common knowledge. Well, it wasn't then, but the Bible said it several thousand years ago before you and me and our big old brains figured it out. God already told you that. Don't touch an unclean body. Don't touch a dead body. If you touch an dead body, you've got to wash by the water of purification and you're unclean. You're set apart for seven days so that you couldn't possibly infect anyone else. Leviticus 7.21 moreover, moreover, the soul that toucheth any unclean thing as the uncleanness of man or any beast or the abominable unclean thing and eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings which pertain unto the Lord, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. This, this unclean thing. Certain animals were unclean to the nation of Israel. We did an entire lesson one time on clean and unclean food. And why? Oh, it doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense. It's polluted. Amos 7 verse 17. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land. And Israel shall surely go into captivity. So when we're talking about the unclean, we're talking about a way of, of, of righteousness, a way of holiness, and the unclean person is not going to be in that way. We're going to talk about that in, in just a minute. The unclean shall not pass over it. The unclean will not traverse this path. His actions preclude the possibility. We talked about that just a minute ago also in Bible study. In Hebrews chapter 6, where it says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and been made, uh, been made partakers of the good word of God, and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again uh, to repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. See, people thought, oh, well, that means that once you're saved, you can't fall away. If you do fall away, you can never come back. That's not what it's saying at all. It says as long as you're in rebellion, you're done. As long as you're in rebellion, there's no sacrifice for sin. Now, if you no longer rebel and repent, that's a different story, obviously. But we need to understand the same concept here. As long as this nation of Israel was living in rebellion to God... They were not in a saved state. They had to do something. Listen to what God says as we continue this text. Then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I give to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal and murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense to Baal and walk after other gods whom ye know not? Then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say... We are delivered to do all these abominations. Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? 
Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Notice that their rebellion, as long as they continued in rebellion, their sacrifices would not be acceptable to God. But what happens? But turn ye, right? Ezekiel 33, 10. But amend your ways and your doings, saith the Lord. And they could enter in. Now let's talk about the wayfaring man. A highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. That is, the unclean will not abide in it. But for the wayfaring. Wayfaring means for him walking in the way. Psalm 86, 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Psalm 119, beginning in verse number 1. Blessed are they that are undefiled in the way. They walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Notice that contrast. You can't walk in the light and also not walk in the light. Psalm 1, uh, uh, 1 John chapter 1. Beginning in verse number 6. This is the message which we have heard of him and announced unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him, but walk in darkness, then we lie. He would say something very similar in chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. You can't walk in the light and also not walk in the light. You can't follow Jesus and also not follow Jesus. You, it's one or the other. They're mutually exclusive concepts. And that's exactly what we have here. They do not practice iniquity. They practice righteousness. That's what 1 John 3, 7 says. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. You can't be righteous and also wicked. You either do right, practice right, or you don't. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Psalm 119, 1 through 6. Jeremiah would say it this way. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. To seek the old paths, the old Jerusalem gospel. Oh, this is the newest thing. I don't care. Don't want it. Brother Frank Chester said one time, if it's new, it ain't any good. And he's right. There's only one teaching that we should want, and that is the old Jerusalem gospel. I don't care of this new age garbage. I don't care of this oriental mysticism. I don't care of any denominational teachings. The only thing I want is the pure, inspired word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ that is able to save your souls, period. Romans 8.1. That is the gospel. That's what we want. Let's walk in His ways. Romans 1, 16, 17. The gospel is God's power to save. Though fools, often contrasted with those who heed divine counsel. Proverbs 12 and verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. Notice that contrast. Jeremiah 4, 22. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are uh, sottish children and have gone. They have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. But to do good they have no knowledge. Jeremiah 4. There's a way of holiness, a way of righteousness. The unclean shall not pass over it. The wayfaring walks in it. And the fool isn't going to err in there. He's not going to wander in. Oh, you know what, guys? I'm going to get to heaven, but I'm going I'm to slide in by the skin of my teeth. You ever seen anybody slide home baseball? Oh, man, he, he was almost out. He just barely got in. Oh, no, you're not. You're going to bust it wide open, and you're not going. Sorry. The Bible doesn't teach anything of barely getting in. The Bible teaches that we're saved or we're not. The Bible teaches that we're faithful or we're not. The Bible teaches that we walk in the way of the Lord or we don't. He poureth contempt upon princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness. Anybody remember that? The wandering in the wilderness. The erring, Psalm 119 and verse 110. The wicked have laid a snare for me. I have erred not from thy precepts. Those in error will not come in to the truth. That doesn't mean that a person can't be taught the truth. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that you're not going to be a practicer of, of wickedness, of error, and also somehow go the same direction as those who practice righteousness. A person will not accidentally get in. Truth must be understood and obeyed. James 1, 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. 
But be ye doers of the word. And not hearers only. Doers of the what now James? I'm sorry. Repeat that. Word. Whose word? Mine? God's. Be doers of God's word. Do what he tells you to do. Know you not that to whom you submit yourself servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But thanks be to God that whereas you were servants of sin... You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which was delivered unto you. And having been made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Paul would say in Romans 6, 16 through 18. Know you not that you are a servant to whoever you obey, whether self or God. And you're not going to wander in the way of holiness, obeying self. You're only going to get through through faithful obedience to God's will. Won't you consider what I've said today? I've said so not with an ugly or angry demeanor, I hope. I've said so not with uh, 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 a lack of understanding of the topic. I've not said so by presenting my opinions. Rather, I've simply presented God's Word and, and tried to do so in an effective and bold, straightforward manner. The motive is love. I want, I want folks to know the truth and I want folks to obey the truth. I want those who know the truth to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be edified. Will you consider this lesson today? The way of holiness, there's only one. Jesus would say in Matthew 16 and verse 18, Upon this rock I'll build my church, singular. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, Those that obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost were added to the church through simple, faithful, humble, submissive obedience to God's will. You can do the same today. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, will you obey the gospel? The Bible says you must hear the word of God. Romans 10 and verse 17. The Bible says you must believe in Jesus Christ, John 8, 24. And we can believe in Jesus Christ through Jesus' inspired word, John 20, verse 31. I won't learn to believe in Jesus through the, the books of men or the traditions of men. I have everything I need to believe in Jesus right here. I must repent of my sins, Acts 17, and verse number 30. Repentance is a change in will. I've changed my mind about sin and I'm going the opposite direction with my actions. We must confess Christ before men, Romans 10.10. 10, and we must be baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, 1 Peter 3.21. And we must live faithfully, 1 John 1, 1 John 2, 1 John 3. For those who have obeyed the gospel, what if you're not faithful? There's a plan for you also. Those who've obeyed the gospel and are not faithful can come back to the truth, acknowledge your sin in prayer to God. He'll forgive you, 1 John 1.7. 1 John 1.7. If you need us to pray for you, 1 John 5, 16 says, we can pray for you. If you're willing to repent, God will forgive you. Do you see how badly he wants you to be with him in heaven? He's made it so abundantly possible for you to enter. Won't you do so? We're going to sing an invitation song as we do. If any have need, the invitation is yours. We beseech you, therefore, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God right now as we stand and sing.